One of the most distinctive sections of the United States is the South, a group of states whose economy and whose culture have no counterpart elsewhere in the nation. Key to the South's uniqueness is its past, as exemplified by Mount Vernon, George Washington's plantation home, and by Virginia's recently restored colonial capital of Williamsburg. The graceful and restrained beauty of Southern architecture, designed for a gentry who lived in the grand manner, reflect a society which was essentially aristocratic in character. Its wealth, founded almost entirely upon agriculture, chiefly cotton and tobacco, was concentrated in the families of the great plantation owners. With plenty of money and plenty of leisure, these families developed the art of living to a point of cultivation and elegance unequaled in the more industrial North. And though much of the wealth that made all this possible was wiped out in the war between the states, the graciousness and hospitality of the South remained a national legend. The art of social relations was not the only art fostered in the Old South. The first theater in North America was in Charleston, South Carolina. Opening in 1736, it offered programs made up chiefly of plays then popular in London, often with actors imported from England who found themselves playing to notably sophisticated and discriminating audiences. The culinary art, too, was developed in the Old South, to a degree unrivaled elsewhere in the nation. And this tradition of fine cooking, handed down from the old days, still flourishes. Such southern restaurants as Antoine's and New Orleans are known across the land for the excellence of their cuisine. But upon the Old South in 1861, there broke the war between the states. Almost foredoomed to defeat in its struggle against the North, with all its overwhelming financial and industrial might, the South took up arms. Then, as now, the breeder and trainer of warriors, the South poured her best men into battle for four terrible years. From the Citadel at Charleston, from the other famed military schools of the South, they went out to uphold the institutions they loved and to defend what they believed to be their rights. For her gallant but hopeless stand, the South has been paying since the bitter year of 1865 when she looked about her to find over 250,000 of her best men dead, and her civilization and the entire economy on which it had rested in ruins at her feet. Behind the prosperity of the Old South had stood two major crops. The earliest of these was tobacco, Smoked by the Indians and introduced to European markets by early explorers, tobacco became the basis upon which southern wealth rested throughout the colonial era and beyond. But by 1800, repeated plantings of tobacco had depleted the soil of Virginia and the Carolinas, inducing many planters to join the stream of migration into the newly opened Deep South, where vast acres of virgin soil could be cultivated by importing more and more slaves. Yet tobacco still remains a major product of the South and is today the basis of a billion dollar industry. Second major crop upon which the Old South depended for its wealth was cotton, whose cultivation was enormously stimulated by the introduction of a new processing machine, the cotton gin, which Eli Whitney patented in 1794. The South soon became the cotton kingdom. By 1860, it was raising almost two billion pounds a year and shipping $191 million worth of raw cotton to northern and European markets. At first, purely an exporter of raw cotton, the South found a partial solution to her desperate problems of post-war reconstruction in the discovery that she could spin yarn and weave cloth cheaper than New England. And today, the South has more cotton mills than the North. Since Reconstruction days, the South has had a diversity of agricultural problems. For the great planters, impoverished by the war, were forced to divide their vast plantations into small farms, operated in many cases by tenant farmers. On these farms, worn out by years of planting to a single crop, billions of tons of irreplaceable topsoil have been carried away by wind and water, 
The result has been substandard living, no money for schools, inadequate medical care and undernourishment. Two and a half million tenant farmers, working soil exhausted by cotton or tobacco, deeply in debt to local landlords, merchants and bankers, exist to this day under a form of economic slavery, nearly as degrading as actual bondage. How to educate these poor whites in country and city to enjoy their rightful economic heritage is still one of the major problems confronting southern social planners today. Another major problem in today's South is one which began when her freed slaves were suddenly faced with the problem of becoming self-sustaining. Today in America's South are almost nine million Negroes, for the most part still economically insecure. Though here, as everywhere, the Negro finds himself in the lowest of all income levels, his race has made a brave struggle to better its lot. Since slavery was abolished, Negro illiteracy has rapidly decreased, and today more than 80% of the colored population has had some schooling. The greatest struggle of the Negro has been against the ravages of disease. Due to the conditions of poverty in which he lives, the incidence of social and other communicable diseases is high. A familiar sight, the length and breadth of Dixie, is the rural Negro and the shack which is his home. His chief blessing is living in a land where the climate is moderate. With an income which averages but a few dollars per year, he clothes his family. To feed them, he must depend principally upon whatever he can raise on his patch of ground. To many a family whose pleasures are few and primitive, there is no greater occasion than Sunday meeting. No greater pleasure than dressing up and going to meeting clothes. For the rural Negro lives in the faith that no matter what his lot on earth, there is a better life ahead. Despite all his poverty and his handicaps, the Negro is proud of the advancement his race is making in the South. Today, 34,000 colored students are enrolled in 83 colleges of their own. Honored and respected by both white and black is the late great Booker T. Washington, the Negro leader and educator who first brought hope to his people. From Tuskegee, the institute which he founded, are emerging new leaders of a race which scarcely three generations ago was bound in servitude. Here, the eminent scientist, Dr. George Washington Carver, carried on his research. Born a slave, Dr. Carver made important discoveries which are being used to vary southern farming and to break the bondage of this region to soil-exhausting cotton and tobacco. On a dozen farms, government experts are experimenting along similar lines with new crops. Already, the farmer has been introduced to bamboo, useful to a score of industries. Far more important has been the recent introduction of the tongue tree, source of tongue oil, a basic ingredient of paint. At Ways, Georgia, Henry Ford maintains an experimental station to find new uses for the soil and make southern farmers self-sufficient on their land. And out of southern slash pine, the late Charles Hurty discovered a way to make paper, launching one of the south's most promising new industries. Listing Dixie's resources, NEC fact finders reported that it has a population 98% native born, its birth rate the highest in the entire nation. Second only to cotton as a source of income are the immense timberlands of the southern states. In the production of naval stores, turpentine and rosin, they lead the whole world. Studying its agricultural advantages, NEC researchers discovered that in the south there are many acres of fertile soil, half of it with a frostless growing season six months long. In all the 13 states, there are paved highways to link the producer with his market. With over 50,000 miles of mainline trackage, the south has adequate transportation outlets to the north and west. More than 60 southern cities are regularly served by U.S. airways. 269 cities maintain municipal airports. 
The great rivers of the region are important outlet agriculture and industry. Ocean-going vessels berthed at docks in more than a score of deep water ports give the South the advantage of direct access to foreign markets. Limitless possibilities for the further development and expansion of hydroelectric power in the South were reported by the National Emergency Council appraisers. Fabulously rich in untapped mineral reserves, the South already supplies most of the nation's phosphates, produces two-thirds of all U.S. petroleum. In every southern state, there is still an abundance of wildlife, and preserves sheltering game for the nation's sportsmen and sure food for many a native. A more important source of food is in southern waters. Offshore fisheries provide employment for thousands, and in every creek there are catfish and yellowtails. But listing the bad with the good, the NEC report noted too many industries owned and operated by northern capital, industries whose profits are sent out of the south. The report added that many of these plants located in the south have taken advantage of wage levels well below northern standards. For here the employer finds little difficulty with labor, still largely unorganized. Corrected since are the artificially high freight tariffs, which, the report observed, protected northern industry at the expense of the south. Thus, government fact finders concluded, the subnormal earnings of the southern farmer and worker have held the south's purchasing power far below the national average depriving the whole nation of a potentially rich market. Yet whatever her problems, all good Southerners have faith that the South can solve them by her own efforts, pointing with pride to such forward-looking social experiments as the achievement of the late Martha Berry, founder of the now famous Berry School. Here at Mount Berry, Georgia, the sons and daughters of the South's impoverished farmers and mountaineers are given the opportunity to earn for themselves a college education. The Berry School, with a waiting list of 5,000, has one rigid entrance requirement. Only the poor and promising will be admitted. Once enrolled as a student, every farmer's son must wear his overalls. Every farmer's daughter must make and wear her own simple cotton dresses. To carry on the work, which she commenced nearly 40 years ago, Martha Berry spent her family fortune. Today, school deficits must be met by gifts from friends. But more than anything else, the Berry School depends for its success upon the self-help and cooperative effort of its 1,200 students. Side by side with study goes the planned program of work by which this self-contained southern community functions. Food for the Berry Dining Hall is prepared and served by students. For each hour worked, the boy or girl is credited with 27 cents. And by working 20 hours a week during the school term, he earns both board and tuition. Every Berry undergraduate working his way may choose from among 25 occupations and trades the one which suits him best. In their own kiln, the boys have made the bricks for the college halls and dormitories. Under the guidance of a master builder, these young men have themselves erected nearly every structure on Berry's 25,000-acre campus. In their work to make Berry self-sufficient, they are learning for themselves how the southern soil may be made to grow diversified crops. At the college, there is an up-to-date poultry plant, operated not as a barnyard sideline, but as a business. Because one of the South's greatest needs is cattle, Berry demonstrates that a herd scientifically managed can be a farmer's moneymaker, but the products of a model dairy command a ready market, bring profitable prices. Just as the South needs more buyers, so it needs good merchants. And in the college store, students working as salesmen and managers learn public tastes and the value of good packaging and display. And though practical in its methods and objectives, the Berry School fosters in its students a regard for the manners and amenities of the Old South.
Thus, in the spring of every year, to take their places in the south of tomorrow, go hundreds of well-equipped sons and daughters carrying with them the spirit of the new south. Upon young men and women like yourselves rests the future of the south. When you leave Barry to go back to your communities and carry with you our spirit of hard and intelligent work, you will be helping to restore the South to that great and powerful place in the nation which is rightly hers. This is my hope, my dream, and my prayer.